In most of my recent videos about the moon landings, there have been a lot of people raising issues with the look of the lunar module, claiming things like it's just a flimsy piece of junk held together with tin foil and duct tape, it wasn't even tested on Earth, so how could anyone believe that it was able to fly to the moon? So in this video we're going to address these points and explain not only why did the lunar module look the way that it did, but why looking like that was pretty much a necessity. But first, a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is a great online learning tool for maths, science and computing. With over 60 courses covering a huge range of topics like algebra, geometry, probability, calculus, astrophysics, computer sciences, relativity and even more. Regardless of your current learning level, there are classes to suit and help you expand your knowledge even further. For example, I'm currently working my way through their scientific thinking course, and I love how interactive the classes are. It not only explains the concepts, but it gives you interactive animations to help you visualize the concepts, and then not only tests you on the topic, but it breaks down the reasonings for the answers as well. So even if you get a question wrong, you're still learning from it. So I'm certainly going to be continuing my way through these courses. And if you'd like to give it a try for yourself, then grab a 30 day free trial by visiting brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan. And the first 200 of you to do so will also get a 20% discount on their annual subscription. On the 25th of May 1961, President Kennedy gave his famous address to Congress announcing that he wanted humans on the moon by the end of the decade. This address came only 20 days after Alan Shepard became the first American to reach space, and that wasn't even into orbit. So going from that all the way to humans spending days in space whilst doing a half a million mile round trip to the moon and back and landing on it was quite a challenge. Now if I can liken this to aviation, if getting humans into space is like the Wright brothers' first flight, and if getting them into orbit is like flying from one city to the next, then getting to the moon is like trying to cross the Atlantic for the first time. But NASA had at least already been spending the time since the late 50s coming up with designs and studies on the best ways to get to the moon, of which they had three options. Direct ascent, Earth orbit rendezvous, and lunar orbit rendezvous. Now, the concept of direct ascent is simply build a huge rocket that sent a single large craft all the way to the moon, that landed on it, it would then take back off and fly back to Earth. But this would mean a craft that was very, very heavy, would need a lot of power to land on the moon, and it would basically be reversing onto the surface. A craft of that size would also need an enormous rocket to get it up there, which NASA had drew designs for, they called it the Nova, but such a rocket was just deemed unsuitable. Most factories at the time weren't tall enough to be able to assemble such large stages. Cape Canaveral's launch facilities weren't big enough to accommodate such a rocket, which actually led to suggestions of them launching it from inside a hollowed out mountain in Hawaii. Plus a rocket of that size wouldn't have been ready to start flying until near the end of the decade. Earth orbit rendezvous would have seen several smaller C3 rockets launch up parts of a spacecraft that would then be built in Earth orbit and then that would be flown to the moon. This would however increase the risk of failure because it would need multiple launches in order to get a mission to the moon, plus you would still end up being left with one single large craft that would have to reverse onto the moon. So the decision was taken in July of 1962 to go with Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, in which two craft would be launched to the moon, one of which would land on the moon and then rendezvous back in lunar orbit afterwards. Such a design saved a lot of weight compared to the others because it required only a small craft to descend to the surface and take back off again, and this would then be jettisoned before the burn to return to Earth. So it didn't require a rocket as large as the Nova, however it did require a rocket larger than the C3 design. And so an enlarged design was created called the C5. Now while the Saturn V was a NASA design, it was built by numerous companies. The lunar module was designed and built by Grumman, but they had to design something which could function with the command module that was being built by North American Aviation, whilst being able to fit inside the S4B stage that was being built by Douglas. 
all while trying to work to the outline set by NASA for a craft that could carry two astronauts down on, onto a rocky, uneven surface, support them there for two days, and then get them back into orbit while sticking to some very tight weight limits. Otherwise, the Saturn V might not have had enough power to get it all to the moon. So Grumman really couldn't afford any luxuries for their design. Everything had to be a matter of function over form. Each aspect was just about getting the job done with the least amount of weight possible. All from NASA, whose task was just about getting a human to the moon. Nothing more. It didn't need to be fancy, it didn't need to be armies of people or stuff to build outposts. It was just about completing the journey. Now, I earlier likened traveling to the moon to flying over the Atlantic, because they really were the same concept first time round. These days, thousands of us fly across the Atlantic each and every day, in about seven hours whilst we're lounging back, watching TV and sipping cocktails. But Charles Lindbergh was the first person to cross the Atlantic in the spirit of St. Louis, which took him 33 hours, all by himself, in a plane that was custom built and designed just for making that flight. It had a completely stripped back approach in order to save weight and fuel. And to most people looking at that these days, it looks flimsy and thrown together. I suspect most people would reject the offer to fly that thing across the Atlantic, even if they were getting paid. And when you break down the lunar module design, it really does reflect this same mentality. I mean, let's consider the basics of what was actually required from the lunar module. It had to get two people from lunar orbit onto the surface and back up to lunar orbit. That was it. It was only ever intended to be used in space and it was only ever landing in one sixth of Earth gravity. So it didn't need to conform to any aerodynamic considerations and the stress loads it was facing would be far less than anything it would have experienced on Earth, which is why it was never test flown on Earth, because it didn't need to. To allow it to be test flown on Earth would have forced the design to be strong enough to be able to handle Earth's gravity and atmosphere. Everything of that design was done with low gravity and no air resistance in mind. In one-sixth gravity, everything weighs less. The hull of the lunar module was made of aluminium that was barely a few millimeters thick in most places because it was only ever being used in space and it was only being pressurized to 5 psi, whereas the command module was an aluminium alloy honeycomb up to 2.5 inches thick because it had to contend with re-entering Earth's atmosphere. And yes, the lunar module was made of aluminium, not aluminium foil. There are plenty of documentation photographs of the lunar module during its construction without any of the panels or the foil, which clearly shows a complete inner pressure hull. Now on Earth, the entire lunar module weighed 16,000 kilos. In Moon's gravity, it weighed only 2,700 kilos. So the materials didn't need to be as strong to deal with the landing forces. As for the whole foil and tape, yes, it looks like a slapdash job, but again, it was actually about practicality. The lunar module would spend pretty much the entire mission in sunlight. Now, in space, there's no air to transfer heat. The heating of objects comes directly from absorbing sunlight or conduction through being in contact with other objects that have absorbed sunlight. The lunar module couldn't just be left as a complete pressure hull because it would have absorbed too much sunlight and it would overheat. So the thermal materials were needed to regulate the amount of sunlight absorption. But using materials like metal sheets or thermal panels, whilst looking neater, would have added a lot more weight without offering any benefit in space over using thin foil. And while the crumple material does look quite an eyesore, and you'd be forgiven for thinking it was just thrown on there willy-nilly, the crumpling was actually very intentionally and carefully thought out. As mentioned earlier, the only way that heat could transfer to the hull is by direct contact with the foil. And while the foil is very reflective and would reflect most of the sunlight away, some of the light would still be absorbed. So by crumpling up the material rather than laying it out smoothly, it actually reduced the amount of contact area with the hull, and so reduced how much heat was transferring to the hull. Would have never have obviously worked on Earth, because the Earth's atmosphere would have ripped all the foil clean off, which is why it was never tested on Earth. But then, just because it wasn't tested on Earth doesn't mean it wasn't tested. It actually went through three separate test flights before it ever touched the moon. 
It first flew on board Apollo 5, which was a completely unmanned flight specifically to test the lunar module's functions. It then did a manned test flight on Apollo 9, which stayed in Earth orbit, which was done to test the docking with the command module, test the flight controls, the firing of the ascent engine, and even conducting a spacewalk between the two craft to ensure that it was possible to do in case they ever had an emergency where they couldn't use the tunnel. And then again, it was tested on Apollo 10, which took it all the way to lunar orbit and descended to just 50 miles above the moon's surface, essentially acting as a dress rehearsal for Apollo 11, and allowed them to get some close-up images of Apollo 11 landing site as well. So whilst the lunar module certainly looks very bizarre, it was actually done for carefully thought out reasons to create a craft that was as functional as possible with the minimal amount of weight knowing that it was not going to be constrained by any earthly factors. In reality, if NASA were faking all of this, surely they wouldn't have concocted such a Frankenstein-looking machine. They'd have taken the same route as Hollywood and made some fancy futuristic-looking streamline machine. Weirdly, the fact that it looks so fake sort of validates the fact that it was real. But anyway, that is going to conclude this video. As always, please feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Thank you once again to Brilliant.org for sponsoring this video. If you enjoyed it and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe button or consider supporting me through Patreon. And then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.